been nearly 20 years since I've done anything like this, so I'm quite nervous. O over many years, I've pulled everything from uh, a 201 ton steam locomotive. I've pulled a C-130 uh, military aircraft. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got 40 ton of oh, RAAF wow. Hercules moving. Look at this man go. A 386 ton bounty, semi-trailers, um, buses. I, I guess if it can move, you know, I've pretty much had a, had a go at it. You only got to look at Grant. I mean, he's physically imposing. He looks impenetrable. But it's what's happening on the inside, I guess, that is what catches us all off guard. His battle was, I'm Commander Grant Edwards, I'm Australia's strongest man, and he was weak, he was vulnerable. Ten, nine, eight, seven... I was a strong guy physically. I thought I was a strong guy mentally. And uh, it was probably the greatest wake-up in my life when I realised that for once I wasn't. In my mind, no one would work with me because the perception was he's an utter, he's, he's crazy, he's unreliable. I believed if I exposed my psychological weaknesses that it was a career breaker. Grant's had an incredible career in the AFP, so he's worked investigations um, across a number of offices uh, in Australia, but internationally as well. He's always been prepared to put his hand up and take on difficult challenges. When the commissioner rang me to uh, tell me that I was being appointed as a Commander Americas out of Washington, D.C., one of the best jobs that you could ever ask for in, uh, in the AFP, and uh, sort of thinking, oh, Am I up for this? Because nothing was right in my head. Nothing was working for me, you know. Couldn't have made a decision to save my life. It may look like an anti-terror operation, but the police target is an alleged computer hacker. Grant's covered just about every aspect of crime or AFP response there is. You could pretty much name any crime type and Grant has been there. The man could have potentially caused considerable damage to Australia's national infrastructure. I mean, right, right through his career, Grant's been operational. He's been at the pointy end of the work that we do. They can buy a woman uh, in, uh, in Thailand for, uh, say, five to 10,000 uh, Australian dollars. We see the worst of society and the worst of life, and sometimes uh, people don't understand that and the impacts that has. The storage devices are alleged to contain thousands of child abuse images and videos. In 2003, Grant established the Transnational Child Exploitation and Trafficking Team. He, he often speaks of that time. It was the early days of really the, the proliferation of the internet, um, and the volume coming in was just Unbelievable. This 67-year-old in Western Sydney could be just the beginning. He and 10 others face charges of sharing graphic images of children being abused. I started to recognise that, that it was impacting my people. And I said, look, you know, I'll take the really bad stuff so that they didn't have to... I completely underestimated um, the impact that that had. The images that we've seen range from uh, the very low end of child exploitation right through to the highest category where we're talking uh, torture, bondage um, and the highest levels of, um, of rape. Anyone who's worked in child exploitation, um, there has to be a toll. You were trying to get them into the court system where you've got enough evidence, you know, like you're actually looking for more evidence, you're looking for more of the atrocities. One of the, the cases that we got was a, a referral from Interpol. It was a grandfather who was, and we later found out he was a, an ex-police officer, an ex-medic in the military. We didn't know it was his granddaughter at the time, but he would pay her five dollars. And she knew every time he, uh, every time he put the five dollars out, she knew that she was about to get a needle and she'd start crying. And she would sob uncontrollably and, you know, he would console her and then lay her down and inject her in the, in the backside and then she'd go to sleep. And, and that was the only bit of that whole thing that was, you know, or I thought, thank God for that, because that poor girl at least didn't know what was being done to her. 
I don't think in the AFP we've properly understood how difficult it is to work in these challenging areas. When you're dealing with children, there is nothing that gets and eats away at us more than the abuse of kids. I can still describe many of those images because they burn into your brain and you, you just can't get rid of them. It has to resurface, you know, they can put things in a box for so long and then the box has to get opened. He would never express how anything affected him. He was just the police officer, the elite athlete. Our childhood was tough, even though we weren't neglected. We had loving parents, um, but we had quite dysfunctional parents in one sense. Dad told Mum that he was homosexual. And back in those times, the stigma that was put against Grant, that he had a gay father. His mother turned to alcoholism after his father had left the family. Um, that created a lot of issues for Grant as well. To be, to be bullied and, you know, and, and called a poof's boy and things like that, um, it was hard. I, you know, I played rugby league on weekends, but I just struggled to hurt people. And I, I remember being called, you know, oh, you're, you're a pussy, you're a dog, you know, come on, you know. Grow some testicles and all that kind of stuff. To just reinforce this idea that I was useless. But I did, I, I did find a sport and I started to excel in it, and it was athletics. Grant's childhood shaped him into an elite athlete. I think sport was his escape. As a young boy, I used to watch the old wide world of sports and they had the, in the 70s, late 70s, had the strong man on there. And I, I said to myself, I'd love to do that one day. Federal policeman, here he goes from Australia, chasing 26-1. Oh, look at the time, look at the time, Grant Edwards, he's done it, he's done it, he's on fire. Oh. In 1999, Grant won Australia's Strongest Man competition. He got out there and um, lifted heavy things, pulled things that people would normally sit on and buy a ticket for, and he loved it. Australia's Grant Edwards had a massive hurdle ahead of him, but he pushed on. Within seconds, Grant got the wheels rolling. This is a new world record, 36.8 metres. Lo and behold, got in the Guinness Book of Records. I sort of got to become known as the, the strong man. I've got a bit of a varied sporting background with um, track and field, bobsled, gridiron. Grant Edwards, the Australian, limping badly because of his pulled hamstring in the loading race. Competed in the world's strongest man in 99 in Malta, competing against all the best uh, strong men in the world. The sound effects are incredible. Oh, he's really gritting his teeth. It's finished 37.38. I met Grant at the gym in Canberra. Oh my gosh, at first I didn't even think that he was in my league. Um, he was amazing. He um, had such a presence about him in the gym. He was so super strong. My mother always said, don't marry a policeman. So I married a policeman. <laughs> and our daughter Jacinta was born in 2011. And I know when I met my wife, the one thing she said to me, look, I know what you do and I know where you go, but there's only one place in the world I don't want you to go, and that's Afghanistan. <laughs> 2012, I deployed to Afghanistan. I didn't realise that I'd be out there every day in the streets of Kabul outside of the green zone, you know, going to some pretty scary places. And when you have rocket attacks and, you know, your, your compound gets attacked and airport gets attacked and there's shootings. It was one of the most testing, challenging environments that AFB has ever operated in, if not the most challenging environment. I had folks from Canada, France, Croatia, the USA, um, the UK all working to me and, uh, you know, in my mind, the buck stopped with me. Now, what would I do if, uh, you know, if there's a situation where we had to evacuate? How would I get guys? How would we get to the airport? Because the airport was always attacked. It was a 
constant adrenaline rush. There was never downtime for him. Even when he was sleeping, it was intense. When he came back from Afghanistan, he was so excited to be back with us. And then there was a change. Things really started to unravel for me um, after that period, and I, and I didn't know why. He started to withdraw. He, he th started to get injuries. He completely threw his time into training, working out medically why he was feeling the way he was. I kept saying to the specialist, I'm a physically fit guy. I'm, I've prided myself, but everything's falling to pieces. His whole focus became himself, his body, and what he needed to do to fix it. And I was sitting there questioning whether or not this was something else. The advanced teams are already arriving. This Russian jet is carrying security equipment for President Putin. In November 2014, the world leaders came to Brisbane for the G20. Arguably, it's one of the largest peacetime security operations for uh, Police Australia's ever seen. In the city, police are out in numbers and South Bank authorities confiscated. Grant took over the role of the um, airport commander for Queensland. We've uh, essentially doubled our capacity uh, for the next uh, five days, bringing in police, Australian federal police from all parts of Australia. Grant was somewhat distracted in the lead up to G20 when he just arrived back from Afghanistan. I had the capacity to turn up at work but I really didn't have the capacity to do anything meaningful. And, and Sharon Cowden, who was at the time my superintendent, ran that and did an outstanding job. Grant, as one of our most senior officers for the G20, was under incredible pressure. It's those moments of high intensity when you're under a lot of pressure that the cracks start to appear. We were, you know, in the hurly burly of work and we really didn't dwell on it as, as much as we probably should have said, hang on a minute, it is probably time now for a bit more help. You know, I was having bad migraines, I, I couldn't sleep, I always had this fog. A typical day for Grant would be to get up and train, go to work, come home, sit on the couch, have drinks, put Bomb Patrol in Afghanistan on TV, and that was his day. I became very, very disconnected with my family. I started to drink a lot, and drinking isn't in my, in, in my habit. You mix spirits with with painkillers. Um, it's amazing how everything goes away for a short period of time. And then the voices started, you know. Listen, it's just easy if you, you know, end it. It's easy. And I, I'd be spending hours on the road driving between the Gold Coast and Brisbane, and, and I remember thinking, yeah, left hand down, into the tree, it's over. And then I would torture myself. I'd say, in that week, you can't even end it, you know? So well, what those people used to say when you were young were right, you know? You're a dog, you're, you're weak, you, you know, you're not tough, you're this and that. And I just could repeat this cycle and, and the damage, the damage that I was doing to people that loved me, I, you know, I had no idea. He gave nothing. He gave absolutely nothing back. And I knew he couldn't, I knew it, but it doesn't change how your heart feels. So I went to my local GP. I, I wanted to get some sleeping tablets. How have you been? And, and I was telling him, you know, all the things and saying, you know, I don't know what's going on, Doc. You know, it's just, this, so many things are happening. And he said, well, I thought for a long time you've had PTSD. And what, what? And he said, yeah, PTSD. And I heard those four letters. And that was the last thing I heard come out of his mouth. And I'm thinking, post-traumatic stress disorder, that's, that's, my life's gone, my job's gone. You know, now I'm going to be cast as a crazy person. So really, these are pretty innocuous medications, and you just take one a day. I sort of drifted back into consciousness, if you like, and he was saying, look, I'll, I'll write your prescription uh, for antidepressants. We spoke about it that night. And then he just looked at me and with the most intense look and seriousness said, I'm going back to the doctors tomorrow and giving him this prescription back, it's a career ender. Your weapon's taken from you. 
you, you can't secure a security clearance and you need a security clearance to do the work that you do. And then there's a stigma attached to it that, you know, you're, you're weak, you're frail, you've got mental problems. We, we see ourselves as the protectors and the protectors are supposed to be infallible. I just selected Grant to go over and head our team in the Americas. So he was to be our most senior officer in North and South America, running a really important part of our operations. His anxiety kicked in with the fact that I'm Commander Grant Edwards, I have been able to put up a facade for so long and I'm not going to be able to do that. I was out the track one day and I, I remember sitting under a tree and I, I just started to get this ringing, buzzing feeling in my ears. And I'm like, I can't do this anymore. I, I just can't do this anymore. This is, every ounce of energy is just being sucked out just to live. Um, and I just started to cry uncontrollably and I went, shit, I've got to find my sunglasses because I can't, I can't be seen to be crying, you know? I'm this big, strong guy. I think his facade fell apart and all of that strength just left him. I think every box he had managed to close opened and he was just hit with everything. Well, I had my iPad with me. I started to write an email to my wife and I remember she rang me and she goes, you got no idea how long I've been waiting for you to say this. She goes, right, we'll get this sorted. And, you know, I, it was like this big weight had lifted off my shoulders. He suddenly realised that it wasn't a physical injury that he needed to fix, it was his mental injury. And he got his antidepressants, flew to Canberra. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you. Saw Commissioner Colvin and, and told him exactly the circumstances. I said, I've got some problems. I can't remember how long I agonised about having to have that conversation. And uh, it, it, it's probably one of the toughest things, you know, to, to do. It came as a, as a shock to me, to be honest. I mean, as someone who I'd looked up to and still do, to hear that he was struggling was a surprise. You know, I, I didn't know. I didn't know that I had a problem. And he said, you're getting treatment? And I said, yep. And he said, you, you know, you're seeing someone? Yep. And he said, well, that's all I ask for. I never considered not sending him to Washington. I was really amazed. Well, I was entirely concerned that with his well-being. This is an international problem. And we know that, and it needs people like you that's come forward. And that, for Grant, was a massive turnaround. Well. To have the commissioner say to him, You've, I've got your back. You know, I'm there. Meant Grant could, he could see a light. I immediately started on the antidepressants. It, it, it evened me out. I had clarity and I remember saying to people, I know what normal is now. I thought I was living normal. I, I remember the doctor saying, you know, these don't make you better. They just make the space for you to get better. If we look back through how police and the AFP have dealt with mental illness or PTSD in the past, we've tended to stigmatise it. So what it's done is create an environment where people aren't sure about coming forward. Grant wants to stand and, and speak up now and I guess there's an element where he, he thinks of Audrey. The ACT's new police chief has started work. Audrey Fagan comes to Canberra's most senior police role from the AFP's federal operations. Audrey was very, uh, very good to me when I first came down um, to Canberra. We worked together and um, we became quite close, her family and my family. And she was a fantastic person. I admired her immensely as a female leader in a predominantly male environment. When Mum was the Chief of Police in the ACT, it was a very highly stressful role. There was a lot of criticism in the media. And I also can't understand how much more stress she put herself through because she didn't, like, confide in anyone or really reach out to anyone to tell them what was going on. We kept saying that we needed to have coffee, which is usually kind of the code word. We'd organise a time and then she would be busy and then I'd organise, she would organise another time and I'd be busy. The imagery that I'll never forget 
I was walking back in and I pressed the button for the elevator and it opened and Audrey was in the elevator going downstairs to her car with her bags. And I put my hand up and I went and she, and she went, yes, coffee, Monday, oh, m next week when I'm back, definitely. We're, we're up for it, let's do it. And I remember those doors closing and I, and I thought, wow, okay, that's, I, I, that's the chirpiest I've seen her for a long time. That was the last time I saw her. Late yesterday afternoon, the 44-year-old was found dead in a hotel room on Queensland's Hayman Island, where she was holidaying with her husband. And I can't begin to imagine how that would just soul destroy a child to know that their mother took their own life. I don't know how to explain my whole world. It was not normal anymore. I just was so... I just didn't know who I was meant to call to talk to about it. And that was the worst. Like, I'm really close with my dad and my grandma and my family, but I just, it was mum who I needed to talk to and I couldn't talk to her. My mum was always seen as the cool mum. <laughs> she was a lady who could fix any problems from boys to her hair looking right. Make her smile. <laughs> I would never have thought Audrey, you know, would have been that person, not in a million years. I kicked myself forever and a day saying, why was work so important that I couldn't have made time to talk to her? And, she may have opened up to me and we could have done something. Some people in the police force said to me, oh, I could, I could tell your mum wasn't right. I could tell Audrey had too much on her plate. I could tell. And it just, it was the thing that hurt the most because you, if you could tell, you should have acted. It could have been avoided. It could have been prevented. A federal police officer has died in hospital after she suffered a gunshot wound at Melbourne's AFP headquarters. The AFP has released a statement saying her death is not believed to be suspicious. They're not looking for anyone connected to that shooting. Sue Jones, who has been in the AFP for over 30 years, I have no idea how much, how much of the job or how much personal um, issues were at play there. And I think people felt really helpless and that's affected a huge number of people. I've had officers contact me in the last few months since Sue Jones' suicide. A lot of people contacted news.com and said that the AFP is not looking after them in a mental health capacity. So we've got people falling off the edge right now and no one's there to support them. You need to know why. You need to know why people have got to this point. Why do people leave totally devastated and destroyed by the AFP? It's not good enough and we need to do a lot better. We need to hear the voices of all the other people that have an issue about post-traumatic stress. After those tragic events in Melbourne, it galvanised us into action. We had many things that we were already doing. We'd, we'd become aware that we needed to do more on mental health. We, we needed to support our people better. Grant penned an email to the entire organisation um, talking about his experiences um, because he wanted to highlight to, to the AFP um, and all of our people that there's hope. For too long, we have been too quiet. Quiet because we don't feel we can share issues like this. You can still go through this and you can still have your career and get your life back together. From my experience, uh, PTSD, there's no one size fits all. It isn't discriminate uh, and there is no one panacea in regard to this. So Sue Jones' suicide, incredibly and sadly, has created the momentum for a, a program of welfare officers. It's created the momentum for a mental health strategy board to start looking at what do we need within the AFP to help our employees. We haven't always done it well in the past. We need to remove the stigmas. We need to make it OK for a police officer to put their hand up and say, I might need a break or I might need a little bit of a help. It's not a perfect organisation, but the profession is not perfect either. And, um, and, and we get hurt. And we get hurt not only physically, but more importantly, we get hurt mentally. It's incredible to see the amount of people now who 
have started to look at themselves and say, hey, I think maybe I might be heading down that path. Oh shit, no, not me, I don't have that. It's given people inner strength to go, if Grant Edwards can have this, then it's okay for me to have this. Well, I'll give you a prescription for any depressions. Go away and think What I would it. like to see is that, is that psychological injuries and mental, mental health issues just becomes part of the vernacular. In 2015, Grant took up his role as Manager Americas in Washington, D.C. The National Peace Memorial is a day to remember fallen police officers. America stands strong with our men and women in blue. Believe me, we stand strong together. I'd say on the spectrum of recovery, I'm towards um, the better part, the end part, but I'm still on medication. I'm more acutely aware now of, of triggers and I know when I need to take a little bit of a back step and, and just calm down and think. He worked on his head. He didn't work on his injuries. He saw psychologists regularly. He would talk to me all the time. I was his gauge. I've got my old husband back. You can be physically strong, you can move a 14 tonne truck, but you can be exceptionally weak in the psychological sense. And it's, it's okay to say that. It's not to be embarrassed. It's not a career ender. It's not a life ender. You know, you're stronger by coming out and dealing with your issues. Such a lonely sound from far Can you feel someone Creeping up behind you And you're too scared to see If you might know them Every strong man gets scared sometimes For more information and support on issues raised in this program, contact the following services.